I'm Carol Klein, and this is my home Glebe cottage. When I'm not presenting or writing about gardening, this is where I spend most of my time, and where I've been honing my horticultural skills for 40 years. Whether you've got a spacious plot, a tiny patio, or a few window boxes, there's nothing more exciting and satisfying than creating your own garden. From basic to more advanced techniques, I believe anyone can learn how to do it. Whether you're a complete novice or an experienced gardener, I want to help you develop the skills to make your garden grow. I'm ready. Are you? What an absolutely glorious day, isn't it? It's autumn and yet that sun is really beating down and everything's enjoying itself, including this spider who's woven her web right across from the seed heads of that Hesperus, remnants of summer, across to this lovely Crocosmia. Here at Leap Cottage, some plants really come into their own during autumn. Down by the potting shed, some of my flowering bulbs are truly starting to shine. Let me introduce you to this autumnal beauty. Isn't she lovely? This is an amarine, and this is her time to shine. During the summer, there have been great big green strap-like leaves, but gradually they've died down. And then up comes a bud long, long stem and then opens to this glorious head of flower. If you look closely at these petals, each one of them sparkles. They're iridescent. They're absolutely lovely. And you couldn't help but stop and admire the beauty of these flowers every time you walk past them. If you want to grow them, then make sure that you don't plant them too deeply. They want to be sitting almost on top of the soil, just with their nets protruding, in a sunny place wherever possible. If you live in a really, really cold place, then it might be worth planting them in pots, just as these have been. But plant them anywhere so you can enjoy the beauty of these flowers. Amarines are the fireworks of autumn. In the brick garden, another kind of bulb is having a seasonal soiree. Oh, aren't they absolutely gorgeous? Aren't they so elegant, so graceful? I've been waiting to see these lovely gladiolus calianthus since I planted the corms way back at the end of April or the beginning of May. When I planted them, I chose tall pots because I wanted to accentuate the stems that I knew would rise out of them. So Gladiolus calianthus is a corm, all gladioli are corms, but this is a very unusual one. It's not bred at all. This is the plant as it occurs in the wild, and it grows in sort of damp, marshy meadows, all the way down from the, the top of East Africa, right the way down from Ethiopia to Mozambique. Just look at that delightful flower. Pure white when you see them from a distance and then when you look into them they've each got this deep violet marking. Those are probably pollen lines to draw the insects in. I grew them not only for these beautiful beautiful flowers but because of the scent that emanates from them especially in the evening and they should make a really good show for weeks and weeks. So when they've finished flowering, I'm going to take the pots indoors because they're not hardy, they're absolutely tender. And whilst I'd love to spend longer delighting in my seasonal displays, I've got work to do. Well, autumn is the time to plant most bulbs, all those spring flowering bulbs that we love. Narcissi and tulips, so many of them. My ground is very heavy, it's very wet, 
and it's not the sort of soil that tulips really like, so I always invariably grow the great majority in pots. And I like to plant just one variety in each pot and have a whole load of them, so you really get some impact. Oh, this is Purissima, otherwise known as White Emperor. And no wonder it's got these great big gorgeous white flowers on quite short stems too so they don't get snapped off. Anyway, I'm going to use some broken bits, some crocs in the bottom of these because what tulips need above all else is drainage. And now the really important bit. The majority of this compost is peat-free multipurpose and then there's lots of sterilised loam in here there's lots of grit and I've added additional lime to this because tulips thrive on alkaline soils. So I'm going to fill these pots now to about probably within four inches, four or five inches of the top. Just creates a, a sort of bed for them to sit on. When you're planting any bulbs, you always look for this base plate. This is what shows you which side goes downwards, and that's where all the new roots will come from. And this pointy bit at the end, of course, that's where the shoots come up. But just to think, in this bulb, that already contains all those leaves and that great big, huge flower. So I'm spacing them out and nearly, nearly touching, but not quite. That means that if any of them should rot, that it won't affect the others too. And tulip bulbs have this means to lift themselves to exactly the right place. So if you plant them too high, they'll push themselves down too. They have something called contractile roots. So as you go, if you just push your fingers down in between, because they want to be in there firmly. And then I top my pot right up to the top because they'll sink a little bit when you water them anyway. And then loads of grit on the top. Tulips love grit. <laughs> nice noise, isn't it? <laughs> and then just as a final, final thing, take another pot. And just use that to push. I'm going to put my pots out on this terrace one of the reasons for keeping them up here is that the animals are around, so we don't get any trouble with mice or squirrels actually eating the bulbs. Because you look after them, don't you? Hmm? Bulb planting is high on my list of awesome jobs. The results next year won't just be ornamental, some of them will taste delicious too. Isn't this a magical sight? Last week, as I was walking past here, I was thinking, why on earth haven't I planted something there? But of course, I did a long time ago. I planted these colchicum, and you only see these when autumn arrives. They're a true sign of the season. There's something mysterious, almost sinister about them. These bare stems, not a trace of leaves at all. And then these beautiful flowers, which will open up with a bit of awesome sun penetrating this canopy overhead. They're such a delight. And whilst these shooting stars have a beauty that's all their own, they too grow from bulbs, just like those showy amarines. How is that for perfection? This tall stem and this great white chalice on the end. And though there are no roots at all, it's not in the soil. It's just growing, because this bulb contains absolutely everything it needs. Not only these beautiful flowers that appear in the autumn,
but also the leaves which will expand next year too. This is Colchicum speciosum album. It's one of my favourite bulbs. I love its purity, its simplicity, it's immaculate. First sight, this looks like a crocus, but they're a completely different family. Crocus grow from a little corn. Colchicums grow from these big, fat, handsome bulbs, and they're related to lilies. If you want to plant them, just choose a site, anything from sun to dapply shade, and plant them really, really deep. Four to six inches is not too much. When I first see the vestige of a bud just peeping through the dark, dank earth, through all those autumn leaves, I realise that very soon there's going to be a whole patch of colour, pure autumn. Nature is gradually undressing the garden. These falling leaves, these bare branches, tell me that now is the time I should be planting my bulbs. I love Narcissi, and I always want more in my garden. And this is the ideal time to plant them. What I want to put in here is a beautiful daffodil. It's called Narcissus Poeticus recurvus. It's the poet's daffodil. Probably stems from the, the myth of the Greek youth Narcissus, who was standing by a pool one day gazed into the water and saw his own reflection and fell so much in love with it that he couldn't move. Eventually, he was turned into a flower and that's where he's grown ever since. Let that be a warning to you. <laughs> So I want to dig down as deeply as I can here. We've built up this soil using loads of compost, but it's also had the benefit of all the leaves that have fallen down here, so it's its own natural leaf mould. But I'm going to add a bit of extra leaf mould too. So I'm just going to add a bit on the top and some to the hole as I'm putting it in. And it's a, a good sort of rule of thumb if you plant any bulbs at all, two to three times their depth under the soil. And then I'm putting the bulb right down at the bottom of that hole. And plant them firmly too, just push that soil in and then leave a big space and plant the next one. So you get this lovely random kind of look. But I'm not done yet. Oh no, I've got some more planting to do that should furnish me with flowers in the frosty new year. This is a little hidden corner of my garden. Right now, this is a true autumnal scene. It looks a bit unkempt because it's absolutely full of seed heads galore and loads and loads of grasses that are just beginning to come up and flower. But in the winter months, there's nothing to see here at all. So I want to introduce a dainty little iris so that when I come through in January or February and look up to this bank, I'll see these little flowers just dancing in the early sun. And often they'll come up through snow. Absolutely beautiful. So the bulb I want to plant here is Iris Catherine Hodgkin. She's enchanting. The colour is unlike any other bulb I know, unlike any other flower. It's a sort of marine, bluey, greeny, grey, <laughs> with these beautiful markings on all the falls. That's the lower petals. And she's got a bright yellow centre too, which attracts any pollinating insects. This soil is very, very poor and really rubbly. And that's exactly what this iris wants. Irises like this come from the same sort of place as tulips. So up in the mountains where it's incredibly cold in the winter, baking hot in the summer. When I plant them, I'm going to plant them really deep. It's got to withstand all that cold. So those bulbs will be several inches below the surface of the soil and just a few inches apart. 
because I'd like to see a, you know, a whole patch of this lovely soft colour on the dark, dank earth. The first thing they do is send up their flowers and then later on there'll be a few spiky little leaves. You can almost hear them saying, yay, that's just right. We'll grow, <laughs> we'll love it here. There's such a wonderful variety of bulbs to choose from. You're almost certain to find one that will suit your conditions, whether those are shady or sunny, dry or damp. Well, down at the bottom of my garden is this big square bed, and it's full of the richest, dampest soil, probably in the entire garden, and it's the perfect place for planting these bulbs that I want to put in. It's called Camassia, and they always grow in very damp meadows in the United States and way up into Canada on the west coast. And Camassias have a very close connection with Native American people because they would harvest them from the wild, take them back to their homes, dry them out, and then store them because they're edible. I'm going to plant them quite close together in little groups here and there and let them wander through this whole area. I think that's the way they'd look best, as though they'd just happen to be there. <laughs> so I'm sinking my trowel down into this very wet, heavy soil and it's going right the way down here, so that's about four to six inches. Not too deep, absolutely perfect for these bulbs. And I'm going to plunge them in here right to the bottom of that hole. Whoa, yeah. And then pile this lovely, heavy soil on top of them. You don't want to mess about when you're planting bulbs. You want that soil to go back firmly so there are no air pockets between the bulb and the, uh, and the soil. I remember last spring in the brick garden, the camassias were one of the first things that you really noticed and they absolutely shone out, accompanying Euphorbia palustris, bright lime green, and then this gorgeous deep, deep blue. So lovely. I'm so looking forward to it. In the spring, we'll be able to see the first shoots of these camassia coming up. And then, like most bulbs, they'll zoom, because that's what bulbs do. Now, I'm not advocating you make a meal of your camassias, but of course, there are several kinds of bulbs that we do eat. I can just about dry this. Well, I want to show you some edible bulbs. Now, this is probably one of the classics. It's garlic. You can plant them either in the autumn or in the spring. Both ways they'll work brilliantly well, but you must choose a very, very sunny site, the best you've got, really good loamy soil underneath there and not too wet with decent drainage. And I harvested it way back in June, July, when all the tops had started to go brown and dry. But a few of them I want to take, divide and plant out these cloves. This is my new crop. Oh, look at that, lovely and firm and strong, just absolutely perfect. I love growing garlic. It's so straightforward and simple. All you do is put these cloves in and then basically let them get on with it. So I've probably got 10 or a dozen separate cloves out of that one bulb. So I'm just making these little ridges. And then each clove is going to go in. And when I plant it, I'm going to plant, push it right into the top of this ridge so it's completely buried. You just see a tiny little tail sticking out of the top. So I'm going to plant them at about four inches between them and about nine inches apart in the row. It's not crucial, as long as they've got room to put out the roots and then send up those shoots first of all. I think autumn is a brilliant time for planting all sorts of things, whether you're dividing your perennials or planting out your garlic. The soil is still warm, it's moist, 
It's just perfect. If you want to have a go, separate your garlic bulbs into cloves. If your soil is on the heavy side, make ridges. And push in each clove until just a tiny tail is visible. The garden's full of edible autumn treats. And right now, so are our native hedgerows. Look at that big fat blackberry glistening in the sun. about this for an autumnal picture. It's in the autumn that we really begin to see the, the benefit of hedgerows and the wonderful harvest that they yield. Hawthorns, elderberries, brambles, slow, everything's laden with fruit. Some of them are specifically adapted so that wildlife are really going to benefit from them. The hawthorn in particular, inside is a little seed but between that and the outside, there's a lot of flesh there. So once this flesh is bitten away, it'll pass through the bird, come out the other end, drop to the floor, and then there's just a chance that a new hawthorn tree will emerge. Everything is interdependent in nature, isn't it? Nothing is there just for the sake of it. It's all for a reason. So important are these plants to our wildlife that I planted a mixed native hedge in my own garden. One of the most prominent features in my native hedge at the moment is this glorious Viburnum opulus. Opulus by name and opulent by nature. Just look at those great, fat, juicy berries. Brilliant red, extremely attractive to birds. It's also referred to as the Gelder Rose or Water Elder, and it loves damp places, so it absolutely thrives in my heavy, heavy soil. Look at that big, fat blackberry glistening in the sun. Brambles are one of the most efficient plants there are. It'll spring up from the seed that's dropped on the floor or it'll bend its tips down to the earth and then it can make roots and so it progresses all along the hedgerow. I won't have brambles along my native hedge, they're just too vigorous. But I do encourage roses, wild roses and honeysuckle to grow along there amongst this mixture of different native trees, many of which have lots of berries themselves. The scent of honeysuckle, there's nothing like it at all. And of course, when these flowers have fallen, provided they've been pollinated, you get these lovely red berries. You can grow your own honeysuckle from a berry. In fact, I grew this one a long time ago in that way. You can grow all manner of hedgerow plants from their berries. And there are other ground-dwelling plants that you can start from berries too. Well, I don't normally wear gloves for any gardening because I like to feel what I'm doing. But in this case, I'm making an exception because I'm going to deal with a plant which can be an irritant. So this is Aramitalicum marmoratum pictum. It's a variation on our wild arum, lords and ladies, cuckoo pint. And you can see why people love it. It's got these gorgeous marbled leaves and these will grow absolutely immense and then have great big green spades followed by these lovely red berries. And if I squeeze these berries, you can see these big seeds inside. Now it's a good idea just to give them a quick rinse and get rid of all that flesh. And that's just a bit of soapy water. Quite satisfying doing this actually. Do it when these berries are really ripe. 
And I'm going to actually spread them out first. I'm just going to push them down one by one, just under the surface of the soil. Eventually, they'll make little plants like these. And at that stage, I can put them out into the garden. Those stems will push themselves down and at the base of the stem, they'll form these hard tubers, probably several inches under the soil. And then, left to their own devices, with plenty of rain, lots of sunshine, up they'll come and they'll get bigger and better every year. And then, inevitably, grit on the top, just to make sure that they stay in place. Doing this yourself is straightforward. Squeeze each berry until the seed comes out and rinse off the flesh in soapy water. Push the seed into a compost-filled seed tray and top off with grit. Some people think autumn's the end of flower power. In fact, it's the season when many of our most attractive and hard-working flowering plants are glowing away in beds and borders. And there's one group of plants that particularly deserves celebration. Salvias. It's getting more and more difficult to negotiate <laughs> these paths, especially when you've got a barrel full of salvias. Salvias are wonderful plants. Over the last couple of decades, they've become more and more popular. There are hundreds of different salvias from all over the world. And this means some are more hardy than others. It depends how tough they have to be to survive in the wild. The ones that really catch our eye as gardeners are the ones that come from the new world because they flower and flower and flower. They'll give us colour in our gardens all the way through late summer and way into the autumn in all sorts of diverse shades and tones and structures. There really is a salvia for absolutely everybody. This one's called amethyst lips and you can see why. Because each of these little white flowers on the lower lips, it's deep, deep purple. A lot of these salvias come from Mexico, including this one, but this comes from quite high elevations. So it's liable to be much, much hardier. But this is one called Gregii. The family group is Gregii. And this particular variety is called Grace, with these pale, pretty lavender flowers. This is from lower elevations, from lower down the mountains. So the flowers are bigger, the leaves are bigger, and it's not nearly as hardy. This one is called Rockin' Fuchsia. It's got a much lusher look than all these small leaf salvias. Big leaves, heart-shaped, shiny, with bright pink flowers. There are a whole load of different ones in this series, but they all require the same sort of conditions. They all love sunshine, they all love good drainage, but you must keep them watered. If you want to make more of these wonderful plants, they're really easy to propagate. Now, this is perhaps the most common, the most well-known of all salvias. This is Salvia officinalis, otherwise known as sage. It's culinary sage. It comes from around the Mediterranean, and this sort of velvety texture of the leaves is actually composed by lots and lots of tiny sort of lumpy bits all over the surface of the leaf. And that's just evolved to protect the cuticle of the leaf from the hot Mediterranean sun. And one thing that Salvia officinalis has in common with all other sages is they're really easy to propagate from cuttings. All you do is just hold the stem firmly, just pull it down like that, and it'll come off with a little heel. Put that to one side. So here's another little side shoot there, which will make an ample cutting. So I've got a crock in the bottom of the pot there and I'm using my usual mix of sort of really gritty compost and then I'll remove those bottom leaves. 
and I'm going to just nip that little bit which is the kind of growing tip out of there. If you don't nip the tops out, or in this case cut the stem across the top, then the cutting will head for the sky always. So all these little side shoots, once this cutting is rooted, should just get longer and longer and make a, you know, quite a nice bushy plant with my chopstick make a hole so that when the cutting's dropped in, it's actually flush with the top of the compost. Just so those bottom leaves are almost resting on the surface of the compost. So they're nice and firm. Now I want some grit. And you just cover the surface of the compost. I always water cuttings from the top with a fine rose until you feel that that compost is absolutely drenched. So if you want to try this at home, take a piece of stem about eight centimetres long. Use a knife to trim just beneath the leaf node, nip out the top, then insert into a compost filled pot. Cover with grit and water well. Salvias also make great container plants. So if you only have a tiny garden, you can still enjoy these autumn flowering gems. I'm going to fight your way through these grasses at the moment. They're having fun in this autumn sunshine. Now, back in the spring, I planted this great big pot with all sorts of goodies. We had halibors and we had euphorbias and violas, and it was absolutely lovely for months. But then I've taken all those plants out well, not everything in autumn has to be bronze and orange and russet. There's still time to reprise the summer, and that's what I want to do with this pot. And, of course, the first constituent has to be a salvia. So this is our rocking fuchsia, and I think this is going to be ideal. So I'm going to gently ease this out of its pots. Brilliant roots. Just give them a chance to move out into the compost and this is going to go in right in here in the sort of foreground now when you approach this pot you either come down the steps or up so I want it to look equally good from both vantage points then the next big plant I want to put in is not a salvia it's a dahlia a real splash of colour Quite unlike their wild counterparts, the ones we use now are big and showy. This one's called Purple Flames, it's sumptuous. This is our amethyst lips. Quite a contrast to that first salvia we've put in. I like the contrast between those small leaves and these much bigger, lusher ones too. A different plant again. But this verbena, I've got a couple of these, and if you just push them into this side, so it's flowing over the side of the pot and it, it picks up the colour in the daily too. So noticeable how these purples and magentas shine forth when they're in the shade, so it's going to look lovely in the evening and first thing in the morning as well. So our final constituent, excuse me, grass, is this lovely purple sage. It's even lovely with this purple moor grass too, because when you put a pot like this into the garden, it matters very much who its neighbours are. It becomes part of a, a much, much bigger picture. So I'm going to fill in now with compost, make sure everything is firmly planted. <coughs> This should go on looking good right the way through to the frosts. I think that looks quite lovely. I love the way the colours go together and those differences in textures and size of leaf. Next, I'll be showing you how to make more of another of my awesome favourites. I'm greedy and I want to make more plants. I 
adore crocosmids. It's a plant which bridges the gap, really, between the summer and the autumn. Well, here's just two examples of some of the fiery shades you get amongst crocosmids. They're not nearly as magnificent as they should be because I'd put them into a big pot, meaning to separate them, and then they stayed in that pot. At least the fact that I've neglected these plants allows me to show you this. People think of it as being a bulb, but it's not a bulb, it's a corn. Corns are quite different from bulbs. They grow in a different way. Both leaves and the flowering stems come from the top of a corn. So it's actually a sort of swollen stem. What tends to happen is they build themselves up one on top of another year by year. So those are the oldest ones down here. Here's the year after, and here's the year after that. But of course, it's the one on the top which really makes the best flower and the best leaves. But it'll be held back by being attached to those older corms. So it's a really good practice every couple of years to dig up your cocosmids in the autumn if you're in a warm place or leave it to the spring if you're in a colder kind of climate. Discard all those bottom corms completely and just replant the top one. And that way they'll really thrive and give you good big flowers. But when you plant them, really space them out because they look absolutely wonderful in sort of swathes going backwards and forwards amongst other plants with these big bright sparks of colour right into the autumn. Aren't these absolutely gorgeous? This is a satin flower. It's a plant called Hesperantha, and it's neither a bulb nor a comb. It's got its own way of moving around the garden. And these are different varieties. I particularly love this deep red one. It's called Hesperantha coccinia. It would fly really well in this pot, but I'm greedy and I want to make more plants. And you can see it's a fine big clump. What I want to do with this one is to split it right now. I'm just going to use a little strip in the veg garden to increase it. It's a really good idea, especially if you're doing it in the autumn and things are going to grow on through the winter. And I'm going to go right in here. You have to be brave to do this. I'm going to plunge one fork in here. And I'll put the other one in behind it. No, that's great. Here are the swollen stems at the bottom here. So any of this old root at the bottom, get rid of. Now I'm going to keep on splitting this up. I'll plant them out here to exactly the same sort of level they were in the pot. And they'll grow on over winter. And by the autumn, you've got these glorious, glorious flowers. Aren't these the daintiest little autumn beauties you ever did see? This is Cyclamen hederifolium. It's called hederifolium because these leaves remind the botanist who named it of ivy. You can see the resemblance in the sort of shape of the leaf. And if you look really closely, you can see that those petals are scrolled around and then gradually they'll open up into these beautiful reflexed flowers. I think they've evolved in that way to throw their petals back like that. It's just to make sure that the pollen, which is deep inside there, and the nectar is protected from weather. They're not corms, they're not bulbs, but they're tubers. And tubers are a, a sort of swollen root. They have the same purpose. Your whole raison d'etre is to store all that energy, all that energy, so that eventually, you can continue to plant, you can continue to 
cùng ai trên oh, đường đời chẳng cần so, nhớ anh dù đau dù thương I vẫn còn đợi một ngày nắng lên người quay về đây nở nụ cười tình chúng ta chẳng thể chia đôi Your whole raison d'être is to store all that energy, all that protein, so that eventually you can produce flowers and you can produce leaves too. Autumn is the time of year when they really shine forth. So I'm going to put a couple in here. And they'll love these conditions too. They'll grow in sun or dappily shade. So once these beautiful flowers have been pollinated, something rather wonderful happens. The petals eventually fade and fall and this whole stem elongates and then it starts to curl up and you'll get these fantastic spirals. They're just like a spring. And that's an incredibly clever device because as the seed capsule swells and gets heavier, this spring gets tighter and tighter and tighter and eventually the whole seed capsule falls onto the ground. When it really ripens, it splits and the seeds inside it, which are quite big, are then carried away by ants. A marvellous example of how plants and insects and other creatures work together so brilliantly. So all I need to do now is dig some holes. I think they're going to love living in here. And these tubers that they grow from um, will get bigger and bigger and bigger. Nice little corner, this, just between these rocks. It looks as though it was just meant to be there. Absolutely lovely. I want this one with the large white flowers for this corner. But it can spend the next part of its life in this trough. I love the autumn, all that planting, all those bulbs to go in, so much activity. And yet, sometimes it's just the most wondrous thing to stop and stand stock still and just stare at all this beauty, see all the things that have changed. When you come next, we'll see what a great season autumn is for planting some of my favorite climbers, clematis. And if you love peonies as I do, then there'll be ideas aplenty to inspire you to include them in your garden. Well, I hope you've enjoyed sharing my garden and I'm looking forward to seeing you next time. Bye. <laughs>